Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us for today's discussion on uh, uh, related to MDRC's evaluation of the Green America microfinance program. My name is John Martinez, and I'm the Director of Program Development at MDRC, MDRC, and I have the honor of being your moderator today. Before we launch into the presentation and discussion, um, I wanted to cover a couple of housekeeping items. First, if you're having any technical issues, uh, you know, related to the Zoom, please use the Q&A function to message, uh, to message our, uh, our colleague uh, Ryan Neal from Zoom, and he will work with you to resolve it. You can just send a message in Q&A and he'll follow up uh, pretty quickly. And second, um, we are planning to allow some time for Q&A uh, discussion at the end of, uh, of the presentation. Um, as questions come up for you in the course of the discussion, again, please use that Q&A function uh, towards the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll go ahead and track those and, uh, uh, and answer as many of them as possible. If your question is directed to one of the panelists, it'd be great if you could note that uh, in the, uh, before you uh, ask your question as well, just to kind of help us direct where those uh, questions are. Before each section of the program today, I'll briefly introduce the speakers. Um, and uh, of course, my colleagues will work with me to ensure that we stay on schedule so that we can get to your Q and A's at the end of the discussion. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? First, I would like to introduce Amanda Stern. Uh, Amanda joins us from Robin Hood, New York City's largest poverty finding organization, where she manages a portfolio of grants focused on economic mobility for adults and is the manager of the Pershing Immigrant Opportunity Fund, a $25 million fund focused on immigrant opportunity in New York City. So welcome, Amanda, and I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. I've had the privilege to manage our work with Grameen and MDRC over the last six years at Robinhood. But this story begins two years before my time when the study was first launched. At that time, Robinhood was funding microfinance programs. And as evidence-based funders, we did not have convincing evidence on whether these programs worked to move families out of poverty, which is our core mission. We didn't know if the microloans would raise family incomes well above what they would have been in the absence of the microloans. We didn't know the impact on credit scores, on social networks, and on material hardship. In fact, most of the research done to date had been overseas and had not been set up as a good test to determine whether microfinance actually made an impact. But we did know that Grameen's model was rapidly scaling, and if it proved effective, it could be a model to move many women to economic mobility. At this point, we do have results that begin to answer some of these questions, and we're excited to talk about them today. Next, I'd like to thank some of, our, of these organizations that have made this study possible. First, to Grameen America. It is not every day that a program submits to a rigorous third-party independent evaluation. That took courage and a lot of hard work from the team on the ground in Union City, New Jersey, where this study happened. Imagine having to turn away community members due to the random assignment procedures. Thank you to the steadfast dedication of the Grameen leadership team and to the team on the ground in Union City, New Jersey. Second, to MDRC. MDRC continues to be one of the preeminent evaluation firms in the country. MDRC proved that once again with this study, at every turn, MDRC thought of solutions to any challenges based with sensitivity and ingenuity. Lastly, let me say Robinhood is proud to have funded this study. It is the most rigorous randomized control trial of microfinance in the United States. And we hope that it informs the field, yields interesting insights for further explanation, exploration, and helps us to better understand how to refine programs and support individuals struggling to advance economically. Now, let me turn it over to John again to begin our discussion, and thank you. Great, thank you so much, Amanda, for, uh, for that warm welcome. Um, next, um, before we go into the details of the eva actual evaluation findings, uh, we thought it would be helpful to provide more information on the Grameen America program itself. 
So I would like to welcome Marcus Berkowitz, uh, Vice President, Technology and Innovation at Grameen America. In this role, Marcus focuses on developing and maintaining a robust technology function to support operational scale. And Marcus was a key partner uh, in, in this evaluation and was really with us um, on the ground as we, we kind of advanced that. So what I'm uh, planning to do uh, during the time Marcus and I have together is just ask him a few questions to help uh, our audience understand a little bit more about uh, the Green, Green America program. So Marcus, could you tell us a little bit about the goal of uh, the Green Meet America program and a little bit about how it operates? Sure, thanks, John, uh, and thanks, Amanda, and thanks um, to all of the panelists and the, the attendees here today. So Grameen, uh, Grameen America is a replica program of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, um, and we, we began in about 2008 uh, in Queens, New York, and have since expanded nationally to 23 uh, branches in 15 cities across the United States. And our goal is really to provide appropriate financial services to low-income entrepreneurial win, uh, women uh, to build a business uh, and expand sort of financial health, uh, overall well-being, financial resilience, and financial mobility for both them and their families. Uh, and so we really value robust independent measurements like this. We're a very data-driven organization. And so it was fantastic to be able to finally start to get some of these results back, understand what it is that we're already doing quite well, and where there are areas for improvement or areas that we could do even better. Great, thank you so much for that, Marcus. Um, so now that we know a little bit more about the program, could you tell us about the program in Union City, which is where uh, this research was focused? Um, just a little bit about, how the, uh, about the program and a little bit about how it evolved over time. Sure, um, so you know, first a big thanks, you know, as, uh, as Amanda said to the folks in, in Union City, they really did uh, a fantastic job with this against uh, you know, some, some pretty tough challenges. And just to, to give an understanding of the way that the, the program works, we give, um, Group, we're a group-based lending institution, which is not very common in the United States. So when a financial institution, we face the same you know, constraints as any financial institution going into a community, we don't know who's really going to invest the funds in their business in such a way that it improves their lives and their families' lives. But you probably do if you live in that community. And so the way that we uh, sort of get around, you know, we don't want to ask for collateral or credit scores as an input. We don't want to ask for a business plan or things that uh, you know, formal documentation that these folks may not have. Uh, and so as a way of getting around that, we do a sort of different type of underwriting where we say, you know, look, because you, the community member, excuse me, I have a mosquito, uh, you, the community member, uh, it knows these folks um, uh, better than we do, you are sort of able to underwrite them and they form a group uh, of five women who then come to us and form a larger group. Um, and what this, this really does is, of course, John, I'm not going to hitch my wagon to you if you're not going to be sort of the sort of person who's going to be responsible and invest the money and pay back, and you're not going to hitch your wagon to me if I'm not doing the same. Um, and so in that way, we create this group accountability um, that's very different than a, a traditional underwriting process so that we don't have to do that. And so I think that's just uh, a really helpful context. So, you know, in Union City specifically, um, you know, across the country, we've served about 130,000 women. Uh, in Union City, that number is about 4,000 since, since the inception of the study and in the inception of the branch. Um, uh, we've dispersed over $1.6 billion nationally. Uh, in Union City, that number is about 34 million. Um, and we've dispersed about 14,000 loans to those 4,000 women in Union City uh, at an average loan size of $2,400. So these loans are very, very small um, for, you know, for, for, you know, the sorts of businesses that you might expect food, uh, you know, a lot of hot and traditional food and, and other um, very, very sort of nano or micro businesses. Great. Thank you for that. And um, just a, a, a last question for you, since I think it's so top of mind uh, for folks now. Um, could you share a little bit about how COVID has affected operations for um, Grameen America, either you know, specifically in Union City or for the model more generally? Sure, it helps to put this in a little bit of context. You know, when, we, uh, when the program came from Bangladesh, it was all paper and cash, right? We basically copy and pasted that, that program. And so over the years, we've gone on sort of a digital uh, transformational journey that, that uh, sort of coincided with the period of the study. Um, which ended with the study did end before uh, COVID. And so up till then we've put in place, you know, we've eliminated cash and paper 
we've created sort of digital channels to be able to disperse the loans and repay them and obviously uh, in a safe way now that uh, that that we're in the sort of the COVID uh, situation that we're in. Um, we were also able to during the crisis um, relieve all interest uh, for a full quarter in Q2 of 2020. Um, we were able to add some flexibility and some refinancing products so that folks, you know, ordinarily in Grameen, you can't get an additional balance if you have an outstanding balance, you have to pay it fully down. So we were able to add some flexibility to be able to give top ups for folks whose businesses had been shuttered by the pandemic to really give them a kickstart. Um, and we've also been able to raise funds for dedicated payment relief um, to really help so that folks aren't choosing between, for example, you know, food or a drug prescription and their payment on their loan. We never want to make them do that. So, you know, the, uh, you know, we operate as a social business. So we do try and cover uh, our costs from the interest that we charge on the loans. Um, but what's, what's great is in a crisis, we can, you know, the, the 501c3 and the nonprofit piece of our model really kicks in and we can really focus on doing the right thing, getting the data that we need from our members to understand what are their most critical needs right now and really go into sort of charity and first responder mode uh, rather than sort of having to, having the constraints that a traditional lending business would have. Wow, thanks for that, Marcus. It's uh, really interesting to hear about, uh, you know, how you all pivoted and the creativity there in trying to deal with this crisis. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, before we turn to uh, my colleague to go, actually go through the findings of the, uh, of the evaluation, I just wanted to remind folks that uh, as questions pop up, please enter them into the Q&A uh, uh, function and we'll go ahead and keep track of those and make sure we get to them at the end. So next, I wanted to turn to my colleague, uh, Richard Hendra. Rick is the director of MDRC's Center for Data Insights and is leading the evaluation of the Grameen America program. Rick is gonna spend a few minutes uh, going over the results of the evaluation, including touching on what we learned about the participants themselves that were part of the, of the program. Now for this portion of the discussion, we are going to share a few slides. So you should see those pop up on your screen. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Rick. Thanks. Good morning and uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna go through the, the findings from the Grameen America evaluation through 18 months. Um, and this is in order to set up our panel discussion um, that we'll be having shortly. So first of all, I wanna extend my thank you also to the Robin Hood Foundation for supporting the study, uh, to Grameen America for um, tirelessly working with us, cooperating um, to help us in our recruitment for the study, and um, also for our expert committee, many of whom are, are joining us today on the panel, who provided really helpful guidance and insight um, throughout the study period. So this is the, um, the second report from the uh, Grameen America evaluation. The first report looked at outcomes over a roughly six month period. Um, and at the same time, I'm sorry, at that time, we saw some encouraging evidence um, for the Grameen America program. We saw reductions in some measures of financial hardship. We also saw increases in credit scores. The results I'm gonna share with you today are from the 18 month report. So this is a year and a half after um, individuals entered the study. And here we're able to look at a much wider range of outcomes, including the study's two primary outcomes, which are net income and material hardship. Next slide, please. So we used a cluster randomized controlled trial design to evaluate the Grameen America program. And what that means is that once a group of five women came together and applied for the study, the entire group was assigned at random either into the Grameen America group which was eligible to participate in the Grameen America program and receive loans, or to the control group who were not eligible for any of the Grameen America services. We designed the study in order to create the largest contrast that we could between the services received by the program and control groups. We wanted to get a good test so we could get the clear answers. And thankfully, we see a large difference in the services received by the program and control group members. Enrollment extended from March 2014 through March 2017, we recruited 1,492 sample members who were in 300 loan groups. Uh, the sample is mostly Latina with an average age of 41. Many individuals entered the, um, the study already having businesses, so about 72% have businesses already, and the average income was around $20,000. The study took place, as you heard, in Union City, New Jersey, so that branch was actually set up originally as a research branch. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so on to the results. The, um, the blue bars show the outcomes for women in the Grameen America group. The orange bars show the outcomes for women in the control group. Um, and we get the impacts of the Grameen America program by looking at the difference between the heights of the two bars. If you see stars within the blue bars, that means that the impact is statistically significant. And what that means is that it's very unlikely that the difference in outcomes is due to chance. So this first figure shows that 18 months after study entry, women in the Grameen America group were more likely to be operating their own business than women in the control group. And this is despite very high control group levels. You can see in that orange bar there that three quarters of control group member um, participants were operating a business at 18 months, but nearly all members of the Grameen America group were operating a business at that time. Next slide, please. Grameen America increased monthly business revenue by $523, and this exceeded the increase in monthly business expenses. The net of this is an increase in overall business earnings. So women in the Grameen America group earned on average $459 from their businesses in the prior month, compared to $319 for women in the control group. Next slide, please. So these next two figures are looking at employment and earnings. So here we see that a lower percentage of women in the Grameen America group reported working for an employer compared to women in the control group. So it's 45% compared to 52%. And this was not a surprise going into the study. We expected to see this given in the focus on self-employment. This impact is statistically significant. And we also see a statistically significant reduction in earnings from a job on the order of $170. It's important to note that um, in this sample, many women combine work and businesses. In fact, Green America increased the likelihood of working and operating a business at the same time. Next slide, please. Green America had no effect on monthly net income, which was one of the study's two primary outcomes. The increase in business earnings, which was about $140, was almost perfectly offset but a decrease in earnings from wage-based employment, which was $167. Um, it's possible we may see a net income effect later on in a 36-month survey. Perhaps as women become eligible for larger loans from Green America, it may allow them to invest more in their businesses and eventually increase their business earnings, but we'll have to wait and see. Next slide, please. Our second primary outcome is the number of types of material hardship that women experienced in the past year. So that's shown on the left. And by types of material hardship, we're talking about things like not being able to pay your rent or mortgage on time, not being able to pay your utility bills or not being able to go to a doctor due to cost. We can see that women in the Grameen America group experience fewer types of material hardship on average than women in the control group. Another way to look at this is to look at the second graph. There we see that only 44% of women in the Grameen America group experienced any type of material hardship in the past year which was a rather large 14 percentage points below the average for the control group. Next slide, please. Another outcome we looked at was credit scores. So Grameen loans are reported to major credit agencies. So here we're looking at um, the likelihood of having what's called a Vantage score, which is one type of credit score. And then we're also looking at the likelihood of having a credit score in the prime range. We find that in a study period, Grameen America um, group members were nearly 20 percentage points more likely than women in the control group to have a Vantage score. And they were also more likely to have uh, Vantage scores in a prime range. Uh, impacts on credit scores are important as being scored helps one to enter mainstream financial services, can help individuals in finding jobs and apartments. It could also help for better terms for things like insurance. Next slide, please. The Grameen America model requires borrowers to open a savings account and to contribute a small amount um, to savings each week. But in our um, branch, there were some delays in getting this set up as part of the program. And it wasn't until about halfway through the study period that um, they started asking borrowers to save money in this formal way. But we still wanted to look at the program's effects on savings. So here what you're looking at are the impacts on the amount of non-retirement savings. And what we see is that Grameen America increased the amount of non-retirement savings. Women in the Grameen America group uh, reported having $1,920 in savings compared to the average savings of $1,180 for the control group. So it was a rather large effect on savings. What you also see in the slide is that there were no statistically significant impacts on debt. 
Um, so the most likely explanation typically for an increase in savings would be an increase in income. But as you saw a couple of slides back, we don't see an increase in net income. So what's going on here? Um, we don't know for sure. Um, one possible explanation for the increase in savings is that the increase um, might be due to setting aside funds from the Grameen loan, or it could be due to the increase that we saw in business revenue. Next slide, please. We also see that Grameen America contributed to deepening relationships, um, fostering trust, and broadening social support systems. So Grameen America members were much more likely to have grown closer to other loan group members. Um, and those effects were quite large, as you can see in the first um, table there. Improvements in social support mean things like getting help um, with babysitting, getting help with a ride, or borrowing a little money. And for a population that um, includes many recent immigrants, this sort of social support can be very important. Next slide, please. Finally, um, women in the Grameen America group reported higher levels of overall well-being and financial empowerment than women in the control group. There was a 14 percentage point increase in life satisfaction. Uh, findings from work-life balance were mixed. So you can see, for example, in the third set of bars that there's a statistically significant increase in spending more time with family, but the last set of bars shows no statistically significant impact in um, spending sufficient quality time. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to just summarize, I know I went through that quite quickly in order to preserve time for our panel, which we're all excited to listen to. So just to summarize the impacts I just went through, we see an increase in business net earnings, but those business earnings are offset by reductions in wages. So we see a, a, that net income at this point is um, not increased. We see, however, large reductions in material hardship. We also see substantial increases in credit scores and savings. Uh, we see that Grameen America participants have better social support and generally better well-being. So one of the puzzles of the study is why do we see all of these rather large downstream effects on material hardship and well-being without seeing impacts on net income? We think it could be due to um, a number of factors. It could be the improved cash flows due to increases in business revenue. It could be the loan itself. It could be uh, the benefits of being scored in, in the credit market. It could be the social support, and it could also be a combination of everything I just said. Um, and we'd look forward to um, hearing the panel's view on what could be happening here. Um, we also hope to learn more from a 36 month report, which is gonna have um, all these same outcomes. So we'll see what happens a year and a half later, but we'll also have a new module on assets, which, which could help us uh, fill in another piece of the puzzle. So finally, I'd like to note that the impacts on savings and social support um, suggest some improvements in terms of resilience. And while we did not collect data during the time of the pandemic, we think that it's important that Grameen America participants entered this difficult period with higher savings and more social support, as this is a population that was and is being affected very directly by the pandemic. So thank you, and I look forward to learning from the panel discussion. Thanks so much, Rick. Really, really appreciate that. Um, so now that we know more about the Grameen America program, um, as uh, Marcus walked us through, and the results of the evaluation, as Rick just walked us through, I'd now like to turn to our esteemed discussants, and I'll, I'll introduce um, uh, each of them. There are three of them. Um, so first, we have uh, John Herrera, who's a co-founder of the Latino Community Credit Union, a credit union that has become a national model for financial institutions seeking to serve unbanked individuals and immigrant communities. So John, if you could uh, turn your camera on so folks can see you. And then next we have uh, Jonathan Murdoch, who's a professor of public policy and economics at the Wagner Graduate School of Public Service at New York University. His research focuses on finance, poverty, and inequality. He's the founder and executive director of the NYU Financial Access Initiative. So welcome, Jonathan. And then we have Professor Lisa Servan, who's a chair of the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of Pennsylvania. She conducts research in the areas of urban poverty, community development, economic development, and issues of gender and gender race. Her new book is The Unbaking of America, How the Middle Class Survives. So what I'd like to do during this section is just go through a few questions that I will uh, direct to specific panelists, just to kind of 
uh, get some of their reflections on uh, the, the program and the, and the evaluation findings. Um, so Jonathan, this first question is for you. Um, the research findings cover many aspects of the Grameen America model, the components of the program, participant experiences with the Grameen America program and their life experiences, and that's both from the perspective of data collected by Grameen America and delivering their services and through the interviews uh, that our team conducted with the participants themselves. And then, of course, as Rick also described, we have findings related to the impacts of the program. I was just wondering if you could let us know one or two things that you found to be most compelling and informative um, in your review of the findings. Uh, thanks, John. I, I want to start by saying this is a really, a, it's a great report. And this whole project and inquiry, First Grameen America opening themselves up to this kind of evaluation, um, it takes a little bit of courage. And I think it was rewarded by, by the insights, which I'll get to in a moment. But I want to say, if you haven't taken a look at the report, it is really a beautiful mix of qualitative and quantitative evidence, of interview evidence. You really get a feeling for the constraints and opportunities in people's lives. And um, I, I learned a lot. So I want to thank all of you who are involved um, in the project. You know, Amanda started us off with I think some of the hopes that a lot of us have had for microfinance writ large, and those include helping people you know, get hold of opportunities, right? Um, you know, to feed entrepreneurial activity, to start and expand small businesses, to grow their incomes, to rise from poverty ultimately. And that really is the hope. My phone is going off. Um, it really has been the hope of, of Grameen and microfinance really since its inception in the 1970s. And as Rick was saying, you know, we do see evidence of that. We see, um, for example, 94% versus 75%, I think in the control group, you know, have a business. I think I have that right. Um, and at the same time though, right, we don't see net incomes rising. We don't see poverty falling, right? And we do see people in wage jobs giving those up in part or not seeking them. And really to me that gets to one fundamental puzzle, which is if that vision, that early vision for microfinance doesn't hold, then why are people seeking it out? Why are they staying with it? What are they seeing in this program? And I think that really gets to a few things that, that Rick mentioned. Um, and one thing that I'll start with that comes out of what we're learning in South India and um, from other evaluations abroad. So from South India and elsewhere, we're seeing that there's a lot of heterogeneity. And I think it's worth pushing on that, perhaps in the three-year follow-up. There are what researchers call gung-ho entrepreneurs, and that's part of the sample. And they seize this opportunity, and they grow businesses, and they really are um, sort of fulfilling that vision that so many people had early. But they're a small minority most people are better characterized as reluctant entrepreneurs. They might not have great opportunities. They have a lot of constraints. This is something they can do perhaps on the side. Maybe they have kids. A lot of the sample, about two thirds of the sample have children in the, in the home. They may have elderly care duties. They may have other duties. So this is maybe something that can be done, but it's not really optimal. So that's one part of it. And the other part, as Rick was saying, is just the value of liquidity is immense. When you don't have a lot of money, having the right amount of money at the right time can be very powerful. And so being able to pay the rent, and we saw these as results in the study, being able to pay your mobile phone bill and not have it be cut off. You also see an impact on you know, being able to pay for your prescriptions. All of thing, these things are very powerful. So while we keep the rhetoric of entrepreneurial finance and small business, it may well be for the borrowers, what they're actually looking for and what they're actually getting is really a, more of a sense of stability, a sense of freedom that comes from having the right resources when they need it. Great. Thank you so much for that, Jonathan. So, um, John, um, the research team presents a nuanced picture of the effects of Grameen America and microfinance more generally. This nuance is an important part of the story the research team is trying to tell. 
In reflecting on what is presented there for, what would you highlight as an important nuance that you think those interested in microfinance need to understand as they review these findings? And, and in your comments, you can relate you can uh, relate them to the participants themselves and their experiences, to the model, or to the impact findings. So anything along those lines. Thank you, John, for the for the question, and also. I want to thank you for it. I'm honored to be part of this, this distinguished panel of uh, experts. And I'm glad to be able to give you my feedback on this research. I'm so glad to see uh, also thanks to the funders who make this possible, uh, because this is a very important question for us here as Americans. You know, how can we alleviate poverty at home and abroad? And I think the Grameen Bank has been an extraordinary model uh, Worldwide, the I'm amazed of the um, I'm always have been intrigued by the uh, the Grameen Bank model, and uh, I remember when uh, Mohammed Junus came to North Carolina, we met with him when he was setting it up, and uh, I wasn't sure if that model was going to work in America, right? Because uh, as an immigrant, uh, our realities and our needs and our uh, access to capital. It's just, uh, it's a different model than the United States. This country is very structured, is very regulated. Um, and we as immigrants, I mean, I admire these women. I mean, if you want to start a business, you start with, with women. I think they make the right decision on, on picking women to make it happen. Uh, but also it's, you know, they have the language barrier. They have the uh, documentation barrier, access to capital, lack of credit, history. Um, I'm just curious, I mean, and, and even though the, you know, we got positive results on this research and some significant statistical uh, results, I think something I see here is, uh, and, uh, and especially in the results of the mentoring and uh, self-confidence and, you know, entrepreneurs have that part in the belly to make it happen. And I think immigrants, you know, my dad used to say, you know, necessities is the mother of invention. We reinvent ourselves when we come to this country. And having access to capital is key. And I think that's what Grameen is, is making happen. And then I think I would like to learn a little bit more about the support that these women get, right? If I, I would call it financial education, mentoring because uh, somebody has to teach you how the system works. It's not the same thing uh, growing up in Mexico than, uh, uh, than doing it here in New Jersey. So uh, looking for, you know, uh, based my experiences with credit unions, with cooperatives, the cooperative model is one that uh, I feel it adapts more to the microfinancing uh, model and uh, uh, something I have learned in this country uh, is you have to do it within the regulatory framework. And there's a lot of restrictions, right? You cannot do everything you need to do and want to do. And um, as you do what regulators allow you to do. So uh, I'm curious to know, you know how does Grameen Bank uh, overcome some of those barriers? Uh, I think it's phenomenal. I mean, it's being incorporated into the mainstream financial system by developing credit history, right? In this country, that is key. Uh, so you get your tax ID, if you don't have a social security number to develop credit history. We, um, and not just to develop it, but how did you grow it, understanding it? How did you maintain it? Somebody have to teach you that, you know? I mean, you can download a, a get a free report from TransUnion, Expedian, uh, Equifax, but somebody had to explain you what those little codes means. And if you're from Costa Rica or from Mexico, it, those things don't come naturally to you to understand and say, oh my goodness, you know, I'm, I'm gonna stop opening credit cards. I'm gonna stop. Uh, there are certain things that increases or lower your credit score. So I think access to capital combined with financial education, and I call it community empowerment. That's what, that's what we're doing. Uh, is key for, for this entrepreneur's success. 
So uh, I commend them uh, in this great work and I keep looking forward to seeing this, this model uh, continue to be developed in the United States. Thank you, John. So this next question is for Lisa. Um, we see impacts on a range of measures, uh, such as reductions in material hardship and increases in savings, but no effects on, on net income so far. Uh, in the report, the research team points to increases in business revenue or the loan itself as possible sources of this pattern. Um, do you agree with this hypothesis? And what other factors do you think could be driving these impacts? Thanks for the question. Um, and and also thanks for inviting me to get a sneak peek at this report before it came out. It's been great to be involved as a witness, uh, observer, advisor on this project. And as someone who's been looking at microfinance in the US for a long time, I'm, I'm really thrilled with the study and, and with the results. In terms of the, the impact on net income, I, I think that uh, there are, a f I have a few different thoughts. I think the hypothesis that you mentioned is completely valid. And what's interesting and terrific is that this is a longer term study. So you will have some chance, uh, MDRC will have an opportunity to test that hypothesis in the field and talk to, um, talk to participants about, about that and also maybe collect some other data. I also think that um, it potentially, the dynamics potentially uh, point to people moderating their participation in self-employment activities and in other wage earning activities, depending on the opportunities that are available to them and depending on um, what their needs are, say, on the home front. Um, I did research with women in entrepreneurship and self-employment many years ago, and one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that they were not always looking to maximize income. They were looking to maximize things like flexibility or to generate a certain amount of income um, to take care of certain needs, like making sure that they could pay school fees or making sure that they could pay for medication or something else that their family needed. So I think we have this um, mindset in the United States for sure that growth equals success, but not all um, entrepreneurs feel that way. They're not necessarily trying to grow their business. Oftentimes, growing the business means not doing the thing that they love that they that got them into business in the first place. Um, secondly, with respect to the relationship between wage income and, um, and self-employment income, we know that income volatility has, do has doubled over the last 30 years. And that's mostly in terms of thinking about people's ability to predict the money that's coming in into and out of their household. Um, and so I would imagine that these entrepreneurs are, are also affected by that volatility and that they're probably their wage earning jobs are the kinds of jobs that are um, that are subject to that kind of unpredictability and volatility. And so what they're the shoring up and increased stability of their self employment positions do for them is to give them more strength to ramp up. Um, either their self their self employment in times when their wage earning becomes less predictable. Um, it's in, not at all surprising to me that most of the people in the study are um, getting income from multiple sources, and I wouldn't expect that to change. That's probably not what they're looking for either. Um, so sort of piggybacking on something that Jonathan said at the beginning, he was talking about the relatively small number of people who are these kind of true entrepreneurs, the people who want to build a better mousetrap and believe that uh, they can't work for somebody else. Um, when I did my research, I found that too, and that the, the other group of people I would call people for whom self-employment was their best available option. They would have gladly, many of them, taken a job um, that came with benefits and uh, stable income if they could have gotten it, but whatever their situation was made that difficult. Um, and so I think that's probably true of a lot of women in this study. And I think um, a couple of the other benefits that you see showing up are uh, really important ones to underscore. The increase in credit scores, which others have already mentioned, the increase in um, work-life balance and, and overall well-being, these are really critical things. And uh, so I think a lot of those things, the um, 
increase in, in, in credit scores and their ability to move in and out of self-employment are kinds of resilience that are probably protecting them from the worst of the downturn um, related to COVID. So I think thinking about alternative de definitions of success besides this net income one are, are key. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, Jonathan, I wanted to uh, shoot it back over to you. Um, as is often the case with complex models that are rigor rigorously evaluated, it isn't always possible to make a sweeping generalization about effectiveness. And at MDRC, we don't believe that studies like this should be ever viewed as a thumbs up or thumbs down uh, of a model, but rather as an opportunity to build evidence for the field and as an opportunity for program improvement, to build on what's going well, and improve where there is room. So I was wondering, based on these findings, what would be your recommendations to Grameen America? And what are the implications of these findings for the field of microfinance more generally? Yeah, thanks. I Maybe I should highlight one thing that came out. I think it was part of the conclusion, you know, the report brings in the voices of borrowers at various points. And I think there was a, a quote from one of the borrowers who said really what I, I value a lot in what Grameen America is providing is that I, I can count on it. It's reliable. I know that there will be loans available. And this element of reliability is easy to take for granted if one lives a life where you have a lot of reliable things. But what we've seen you know, in experience after experience is that reliability being able to count on getting the you know, the money you need or the support you need at the time you need in the way that has been promised is extremely powerful and can fundamentally, you know, change how one plans and how one goes through life. So my first recommendation is that that is a powerful thing and holding on to that element of reliability um, is, is really important. And for others who are thinking about this kind of program, it's not just about providing loans, but it's about doing it in a way um, that being, can be counted on in a context which is often very unreliable and unstable. I also just want to step back a, a moment and kind of echo some of what John uh, was saying uh, about the um, successes. That if we look at you know some of the past attempts to bring these ideas to America, and this isn't the first, or to bring these ideas to uh, you know to Europe. You can go back to the Good Faith Fund in Arkansas, which Muhammad Yunus um, you know, inspired the Clintons to start. Or more recently, Grameen Scotland, Grameen you know, in the UK, in Glasgow, um, which recently um, shut down. They show that it's a struggle to do this, right? And so we, I think, I also want to celebrate that Grameen America has really succeeded at an institutional level in not only establishing this, but going to scale. So what I what I want to recommend though that you know on top of that platform really sort of builds on what everyone has been saying here, which is to embrace the fact that borrowers have complicated lives. They probably have jobs. Many of them probably have jobs. They have other kinds of loans. A few years ago, I wrote a book based on international experience called Portfolios of the Poor. And that seems like the right way to see the lives of borrowers. They've got a portfolio of activities going on, a portfolio of cash flows, and microfinance is just one part, one element of that broader portfolio, of that broader sort of scheme of life. And so this idea that we started with that, you know, entrepreneurship is going to be the thing, and this is all about business, I think we really, really have to step away from that. And you know, embrace the idea that maybe microfinance is a little bit more like a credit card or something that many of us would take for granted that can be very powerful, sometimes a little dangerous, sometimes doesn't work so well for us, but can often be exactly what we need to help make our lives a little bit easier in difficult circumstances, um, but isn't necessarily gonna revolutionize our lives, but will help give us a stronger platform to do other things. That is a big shift in thinking for the field, but that's what all of the evidence, both internationally and from the 18 months so far at least, um, suggests is the way forward. Great, thank you so much for that. 
So Lisa, I wanted to go back to you. Um, this is possibly the most rigorous test of a group microlending model in the, in the United States to date. What role do you see this evaluation and the findings playing? How do you think the evaluation and the findings fit within larger discussions about employment, income, and poverty? Um, great question. And I think Jonathan just did a good job of, of shedding some light on that, first of all, in terms of thinking about the way that we think about this whole field and the role that it plays and that it's not necessarily trying to turn everybody, it shouldn't be trying to turn everybody into a straight up entrepreneur where that's their only source of income, but how can it help stabilize households? And I think in the intervening years since Grameen started, certainly since the Good Faith Fund was launched and um, we have a different concept that um, that certainly Jonathan has helped create about financial well-being um, and that people are able to um, to save, spend, borrow, um, and plan. And to the extent that microfinance helps people do that, that these loans help people stabilize their businesses. And I think that to me is one of the most important findings here. And not only stabilize their businesses, but their lives, right? So we see these increases in things like social capital, the strength of ties between these probably new immigrants and other people who are in a similar position. And I would imagine that the sharing and the support that they are getting goes belong goes beyond just business related kinds of, uh, of support. Um, some of the some of the outcomes point to that. I, I, you know, I think the other thing that that this begs taking a look at this research is to look at the interactions between some of these secondary incomes, the increases in savings, the decreases in material hardship, increases in well being, credit scores, social capital, um, and the primary things that the that the program is trying to do in terms of just building income. Um, I think what we what you see here is a uh, I kind of hate the word resilience because um, people, it's a little bit overused and it's become a bit of a, an empty container, but that is one of the words that comes to mind when I see the outcomes that are um, top line in this study is a, a range of things that contribute to resilience that will help people weather storms that, that they can draw on, that they can ramp up or, or, or take their foot off the gas depending on what else is going on and so I think uh, and deal with the increased financial precarity that so many um, households are facing beyond just immigrants beyond just low-income people now. Great thank you Lisa and so John I wanted to ask you uh, one last question before we turn to audience Q&A and, and thanks to um, everyone who submitted questions to the Q&A and encouraging uh, everyone else to uh, please do so as well. So John the, the evaluation is ongoing as, as uh, Rick mentioned and a future report will present additional findings from the qualitative analysis and the impact analysis around uh, three years after women entered the study. What are a few open questions that you have at this point? Is there anything specific you hope to learn more about? And John, you're, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. Uh, no problem. The, um, I think the, you know, it demonstrates this research that there is a need out there um, and a role for microfinance in this country. And I, uh, but also I feel like this is sort of a model that helps people get started, right? In the right path. And once you come to this country, something we had discovered uh, with the immigrants uh, here in North Carolina with the Latino Community Credit Union is that people want to live the full American dream, right? I mean, it's like, hey, if you risk your life and you, left home behind to come and make it in America. You just need somebody who mentored you, somebody who give you a hand up, somebody who say, hey, this is the way to do it. Uh, and access, right? And access to big capital. I mean, I think microfinance has a role to get started. You know, maybe when you first arrive, you need to pay the rent and you need to get, you know, get by. But, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we said to start the Latino Community Credit Union. Uh, today, we have close to 90,000 members, half a billion dollars in assets. We own buildings, you know, uh, 
folks with documentation and no documentation, we had helped everyone get established. We empower them with education. Folks need, you know, they don't, they don't just want, you know, they want the full enchilada, as we say in the community. You know, they, you want to start, you want to buy a car. That's the first thing you need when you get into the community so you can go to your job. And then as soon as you get that and you have your family here or you bring your family, you want to buy a home. So you, uh, and that's how you build wealth in this country, right? Uh, home ownership is key to building wealth. And having, owning a home, you got some collateral, then you can borrow against your home to start your business. Or, you know, many of our members today, once they learn how credit history works and how credit works, uh, you know, they have a $10,000 credit card. So if they need a pressure washer or a lawnmower or equipment for their business, they just go ahead and buy it, right? They don't have to go through the whole procedure of, of, of it's, it's tedious. Sometimes that's why they do titandas or, you know, it's a family lending thing. They go to the closest relative compadre who has some money and say, hey, I need you to get started. And they lend them the money and then they go, they go on. But um, in this country, I think folks, we need access to the full American dream, right? We need, you know, we don't need to, they say, uh, don't do for people what they can do for themselves. And, and I think, uh, I feel sometimes we limit them. You know, I'm, I'm surprised with the amount of repetitive small loans. Sometimes maybe people just need a big $10,000 loan and you get going. There's some folks, if you are, and you, and you are empowered with the tools, uh, you will, you might succeed, right? That the business you set up. Uh, it, I mean, our lives are really complicated. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed of how folks can start a business and decide while well, they have a full-time job. Uh, I think our lives are complex as immigrants, right? And you have the whole issue of immigration hanging over your head. So there's so much to worry that it's not just the access to capital you need. You need, you know, you're worrying about the health care of your family, about the education of your family, about the future of your family. That's why you're here. So you need access to more than just a micro loan. You really need access to full capital and, uh, and bigger loans. And I know it's really risky, but I'm telling you, our members pay back. We're making money. It's a sustainable model. So um, I hope that more financial institutions jump, regulated financial institutions jump into serving uh, immigrants in this country. Terrific, John. Thank you so much for, for those reflections. Um, and thank you for indulging me and throwing questions your way. Uh, now we're gonna turn to audience Q&A. Um, we have a couple of good questions teed up and to the audience, I'm sorry, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. Um, uh, first, this one's for, for you, Jonathan. Um, how is creditworthiness considered from a microfinance perspective? And if someone is creditworthy, what impedes these borrowers from gaining access to the traditional consumer banking system? So I, I think the, the power of microfinance is that creditworthiness is seen very broadly. It's really seen as, do you have resources to be able to service a loan? And you know what's I think important about the way that Grameen loans are typically given is that um, they're granted in a big chunk, but they're repaid in small installments. And so the question is, really, do you have the cash flows to be able to service that loan week by week in small installments? And that's the big question. That's what credit worthiness I think is fundamentally about. It's not about your assets. It's not about your documentation. It's not about um, security, but and this really goes to the heart of the question, for most banks, maybe not for John's credit union, um, but for most banks, you really do need to have assets and you do need to have particular legal documentation. And that's a huge barrier. And of course, that's, that's where the big divide, one of the great inequalities in America comes. And it's, why ex it's exciting that credit unions like John's and Grooming America are trying to um, lower those walls and narrow those divides. Great, thank you. And um, Lisa, I, I want to throw a question your way. Um, John started uh, reflecting on this in, in his response, but 
you know, as we, we think about, um, you know, the, the results from uh, this study, um, what do you think the, what do you think the next generation of studies should look at in terms of research questions? What are those unanswered questions out there for the field that we still need to be able to tackle as we think about this next generation of studies? Well, I think um, trying to understand some of these secondary impacts a little bit better and how important they are, what the interaction effects of them, um, the extent to which external factors are versus internal desires are reflecting the ways in which people are balancing or, or mixing wage employment and self-employment income. Um, and you know what does happen too if uh, if people are growing their businesses, we'll see if that happens and uh, whether that becomes more apparent with the next level of studies. Also, if they're facing barriers to loans or financial products and services, even once they've graduated, um, one of the things that that seems to be the case is that oftentimes people the entrepreneurs kind of graduate from. A, a small loan program, a micro loan program, and there is no next step. The banks don't want to make a loan of less than 75 or $100,000. So is there a place they can go to get that next loan? So I think um, looking at that as well. Uh, and perhaps um, looking more deeply into the definitions of success that these women are, are, are using to judge their own success as opposed to these externally um, defined definitions of success. Great, thank you, thank you. And, and John, um, and you, you know, all three of you, I think have kind of touched on this, um, you know, throughout, throughout the conversations, but it, I think it would be interesting to kind of tee up this idea that, you know, the results of the, of the evaluation showed uh, some gains in some areas, and then uh, we didn't see gains in other areas. When you think about the, the results overall, how do you weigh the importance of the different outcomes um, in terms of, uh, you know, we saw large impacts on life satisfaction, but no increases in income. And I think, John, in your discussions, you've talked a lot of, you've talked some and touched some on the importance of some of these other, uh, you know, these other things that we saw happening. I was just wondering if you could reflect that on that a little bit. When you, when you look at this, how do you weigh the, the differing, you know, the differing results in terms of what do you consider more important or less important? Uh, yep, I'm on mute. The, uh, I think, I, I mean, these entrepreneurs and immigrants, we, I think we have very complex lives and those priorities are determined by the needs of our families. And I think understanding the family dynamics of these communities is key on setting up those priorities, right? I mean, we as uh, microfinancers or lenders, we can set up our own uh, priorities, but I think understanding the family dynamics and the community dynamics, even you know, some financial institutions don't grasp the immigration issue. You people need to understand, if you're working with immigrants, you have to understand immigration issues. Otherwise, uh, I think you, you're missing a lot of opportunities. Um, and, um, uh, again, I think uh, we need to empower people. People are capable of making, I mean, it's like when they have that desire or that need, they will do whatever it takes to make it. I mean, the hardest thing is to come to this country. That's the biggest barrier, you know. After that, believe me, it's unbelievable. Here in North Carolina, we have 100 counties. And in all 100 counties, you will find an immigrant business running, many immigrant businesses. I mean, it's like they don't even speak the language. Sometimes I go, I interview them. I'm, I'm a social entrepreneur. I, I, I'm not a researcher. But I interview them because I want to know how they make it. And you got native indigenous folks from Mexico who don't even speak English, who don't understand zoning regulations at the county level or city level at the state level. And these folks are making it. So um, understanding how powerful and uh, more than resilient is how they desire to succeed in their own terms. Uh, I think sometimes people just need the tools. And also uh, with success, it comes uh, other challenges, right? 
mean, we see a lot of our members, once they establish themselves or they buy their home, establish a business, you know, let's say a landscaping business, they start getting credit card offers, they got, you know, pay their loans, they have more access to products that can wipe away the wealth they're building in our communities. So uh, that's why I do believe that uh, it's not about marketing, but it's about empowering people, right? You have to give them the right tools, access to capital, and then educate them also. Say, this is how you manage it because, you know, I mean, we, and we know it with mainstream society, it's so many people getting in trouble because they don't know how to manage their credit. And there's, we live in a consumeristic society that is like, you know, I mean, you get offers, you know, I mean, we get members walking into the branch and say, I have a $10,000 or $20,000 credit card limit. And it's like, I'm gonna apply for it. It's like, <laughs> can you manage it? Do you have that capacity? And well, I don't know, but they think I do since they send it to me. So uh, we need to educate our members because they're this close to getting into trouble once they achieve uh, a certain level of success. Great. Thank you so much for that. As hard as it is to believe, we are out of time. I just want to thank uh, John, Jonathan, and Lisa for their terrific uh, reflections on the report. Rick, Marcus, Amanda, thank you for spending time uh, with us as well. Uh, for all our audience members, we really appreciate you joining us for this. Uh, please go to the MDRC, the MDRC website uh, to download the report and stay tuned as we continue to learn more about uh, microfinance as the study continues. Thank you all so much.